Hello, this is a review talk about Ramanu transformation and the Casimir effect. It is devoted to Sinirava Ramanujan, the great Indian genius of mathematics who died around 101 years ago. He was a pure autodidact, but he discovered a number of amazing formula. Gottfried Hardy, who invited him, invited him to Cambridge for five years, describes his, his discoveries as a process of mingled argument and intuition of which he was entirely unable to give any coherent account. Here is an example, a formula for pi, the number pi, which converges very rapidly, but we have no idea how uh, Ramanujan came up with such formula. Okay, this is Ramanujan, and among his achievements was also that he associated finite values to diversion series, which look very strange. So if we just sum the number one, he says this gives minus one half. The most famous example is summing one plus two plus three plus four and so on. He says this is minus a twelfth, and if you sum the cube numbers, one over 120. Um, this looks strange to us, but Hardy recognized that actually these are the values of Riemann's zeta function. As you know, for uh, a real part larger than one, it is given by this conversion series, and Riemann had already in the 19th century um, performed the analytic continuation to the complex plane except for the number one, and the negative if you use negative integers for the arguments, then you get indeed the same numbers that uh, Ramanujan had derived without knowing anything about the zeta function. In his uh, notebook, he only documented one intermediate step, which is this alternating series epsilon, to which he assigns the value one-fourth. And if you substitute it into this, uh, this difference r minus epsilon, uh, you obtain, in fact, four times r. And if you deal with, if you treat r as a finite constant, then it suggests this value of minus one-twelfth. So this looks like a sequence of uncontrolled operations on divergent series, but the results make sense in three occasions, so this cannot be by accident. Um, the fact that he did not document the steps of his calculation is that he mostly worked on a slate. Paper was um, expensive for him, he was living in poverty, and he and trying to fill in the, the, the steps that he might have performed on his slate. So first, uh, consider the geometrical series. We know what it looks like, and uh, in this form, we can take the limit c to the minus one. And then we get formally a uh, Grundy series, which does not converge, but with this analytic continuation, we assign to it the value one half. And then you can take uh, g prime. The series looks like this, and it is again uh, extended to this uh, function, uh, analytically extended to this function. So which formally in the limit c to the minus one corresponds to this alternating series epsilon. And here we cover, cover Ramanujan's value of one fourth. However, this does still not give us the series R, which would require here the limit c to one, but this is where we have the poles. So we have to do something else. We regularize it in two different ways given here. So in this limit, um, also by fun of um, explicit functions. So in this limit, c to the minus, in this case, c to the minus one gives the right uh, series, which is divergent as it should be. But if we take this linear combination, then all the, the poles in the lower series cancel, and it is exactly the same, identical to this g prime. So it must be one fourth plus order epsilon. And in this sense, analytic continuation, this combination analytic continuation works. And then we can justify here the value of minus one twelfth. A systematic discussion of Ramanujan simulations was recently done by a French uh, uh, mathematician. And this looks like a mathematical playground, but in fact, it has applications to physics, more precisely to quantum field theory, where Ramanujan simulation removes a divergent term, which for us is the counter term in a physically sensible manner and thus provides renormalized results. In particular, it predicts a force which has now been observed experimentally. And here I come to the Casimir effect, was first predicted by the Dutch physicists Casimir and Polder in 48, but here we followed the view that Casimir took a little bit later after a discussion with Niels Bohr. Let's first look at the one-dimensional um, uh, case, the toy model for a free massless neutral scalar field where we impose the boundaries at two points, X and D, where the field is forced to be zero. So between these points, we can only have standing waves. These are the wave numbers. 
here and the corresponding energies given here. So the vacuum energy density in this interval is simply obtained by summing over these wave numbers. And here we already have the Ramanu transformation. If we insert his value minus 112, we get this energy density. So this is then the energy between these points. And if we take its negative derivative, we obtain the force acting on the boundary at D, which in this case is an attractive force. So Ramanu transformation actually uh, subtracts the counter term, which is for infinite. So the density that we have without such boundaries, and then it uh, remains a finite difference, which is exactly the renormalized term, and thus it, it provides sensible values for the energy density and the force. An alternative way to derive it is to use the euler maclaurin formula, which exactly um, provides an expansion of the difference between a sum and an integral, and it leads to the same results that, uh, that we obtained here with the Ramanujan summation. Let us now proceed to a phenological uh, setting to the three-dimensional Casimir effect of a photon field. So these are now two parallel plates. We assume them to be perfectly conducting so that, that they impose these uh, Dirichlet boundaries, but in experiment, just any metal plates do a good approximation. So these plates have the same area R and the small short distance D between them. The vacuum energy density is, of course, given um, uh, similarly as before. So we have here the total energy is the volume between the plates times this density. Um, we have a factor two for the polarizations of the photon. The momentum components parallel to the plates are treated as continuous. So we integrate them here and uh, the component vertical to the plates, this is summed over uh, just as in the one dimensional case. So we can simplify this a little and we arrive at this term. Now we subtract against the counter term, rho infinite, so the density that we have without these plates. And then we see, first of all, that the upper bound here does not contribute to this difference. So the contribution is only from the lower bound. And then we obtain a sum over n to the three. So this is the last example that I gave for from Ramanu transformation. If we, do, if we, re so we replace it by z of minus three, one over 120, and we obtain this value. And then we can readily derive the force by taking the derivative of the energy density. And here I convert it back into physical units. This is, uh, this is Newton. Um, so again, Ramanujan transformation provides a renormalized result. And again, the force is attractive, although the signs of z of minus one and z of minus three are opposite. But notice that here we have the contribution of k zero. So this flips the sign once more. This effect was experimentally demonstrated first by Lamoureux in 1797 and immediately thereafter by Mohidi and Roy uh, to very good accuracy, but they used the plate and the sphere because it is very difficult in experiment to keep two plates exactly parallel. This was first achieved a few years later by the Padua group in Italy. They uh, used silicon stripes with these dimensions and from the above formula, we get then forces in this, uh, in this uh, magnitude. And uh, this can in fact be measured. In particular, they measured it from resonant frequencies, uh, uh, the shift in resonant frequencies applying fiber optic interferometry. Now we come to the interpretation of the Casimir effect. First of all, what kind of force is it? It does not seem to appear in the list of fundamental forces, but it must of course be electromagnetic because we refer to the photon field. Principally, it should exist for all gauge fields, but if uh, they are self-interacting like the gluon field and this effect, this small effect is of course overshadowed. And uh, a common point of view, paradigm is to say that this demonstrates the existence of the, of the vacuum energy density. For instance, in this review article, article, the existence of the zero point vacuum fluctuations has been spectacularly demonstrated by the Casimir effect. Now, is this true? Uh, in principle, this density seems to diverge, but uh, we can truncate it, for instance, at the Planck scale and the God scale. But if we compare it to the cosmological constant, which is the vacuum density that, that we have in the universe, a few was taken by Bob Chaffee et al. at MIT since 2000. They work on this problem and they insist in the original picture by Casimir and Polder that this is a pure van der Waals force. They write Casimir effect, Casimir forces can be computed without reference to zero point energy. 
For instance, this should also depend on the coupling alpha, uh, which did not appear in our derivation before. And then Jaffe shows that for alpha zero, force must be zero, of course. And in the realistic settings of the experiments, uh, the phenological value gives a force which is very similar to the force at infinity, uh, which then corresponds to the calculation that we had before. So we cannot distinguish them experimentally with the precision given. And this is an exceptional case that even alpha infinity leads to a finite force in this case. So does this um, demystify the, the effect? Not everybody agrees with that. For instance, Lamar wrote uh, the Casimir and the van der Waals force are quite different. The van der Waals force is always attractive, whereas the sign of the Casimir force depend is geometry dependent. Um, there are many papers who predict a repulsive Casimir force, but this uh, depends on subtleties in the assumptions, so this remains controversial in the literature. In 2009, such a repulsive force was actually measured, but this was for materials immersed in a fluid, so the existence of a vacuum energy density as predicted by QD is still an open question. It seems to be required in quantum field theory, although, for instance, Schwinger performed the calculation with a source fields technique, which does not seem to require it. Usually the question is irrelevant. Usually we only care about energy differences. An exception is the accelerated expansion of the universe, and perhaps, depending on the interpretation, the Casimir effect. A conceivable test would be to send a photon through a Casimir cavity and see if it changes its energy due to the, energy, to the vacuum energy difference so that would be like Bernoulli's principle in fluid dynamics. Thank you.